The chores. The chores. There was a time when the difference between city life and country life was good-natured fun. Goodbye, city life. More like us and the other us rather than us and them. But today, it seems, many of America's great divisions can be plotted on opposite sides of a fault line between skyscraper and barn, concrete and dirt, church and state. The question of loving people who are very different and far away and about whom we have pre- prescripted you know, stories as to who they are and what they are and therefore we can dismiss them is really strong. Marie Matsuki Market lives on the city side of the line, but has long had one foot on the countryside. Because of a family farm she used to occasionally visit, which she has now inherited from her American father and Japanese mother. In her new book, American Harvest, Market travels with a crew of harvesters for hire, following the wheat belt as it ripens from south to north a five-month journey to places in the heart, full of challenging conversations about the virtues of working the land and embracing the Bible. A friend of mine read this book, who's a writer, and the question she walked away from the book with was, um, what, what is a human? And I think that that's kind of a good question. Marie Matsuki Maka, thanks very much for joining us. Really appreciate it and really enjoyed the book. Before we get started, we want to let folks know that American Harvest, God, Country, and Farming in the Heartland is available locally at Left Bank Books in the Central West End. So maybe I'm wrong, but I have the sneaking suspicion that the book you wrote is not necessarily the book you started out to write, that this ended up being more of an exploration of religion, perhaps, than you had initially anticipated? Yeah, I, I think... I try when I write not to have a clear sense of precisely what it is I'm trying to do. If it's not a discovery for me, then it won't read like a discovery for the reader, right? And then it it might, the reader might feel um, like I had some kind of agenda um, and that I'm giving them some propaganda. And I don't like it when I, when I have that happen to me. I mean, part, if I'm going to spend, especially as I get older, if I'm going to spend time reading, I want to have some of that feeling of discovery and adventure, the things that captured me as a reader when I was younger. Um, So when I began working on American Harvest, I really was focused on this question of, which I stayed in the book, you know, why are all my friends who who are in New York City, at the time I was living in New York City, um, so concerned with buying and eating organic food, and yet the people I know who farm in this country are aware of organic food and in some cases are organic farmers, but by and large are less worried about that. Um, But then they tend to be Christian and open to GMOs and to scientific advances um, in farming and in food production. And then my friends in the city um, tend to be rationalists, materialists, believe in evolution, um, but are really, really devoted to organic food. And I thought, what's going on? there. And that's really how it began. Um, and then it and then it veered into all this other territory. It's kind of a, a central question that the book turns on, but really it's more like a paradox than a question trying to figure out that, that disconnect. And it led you on this path to really kind of explore religious topics. Were you nervous about that at all? Because it's such a touchy subject. Absolutely. I was nervous. <laughs> <laughs> Can't blame Absolutely, you. Absolutely. I was nervous. I was nervous. Um, in multiple ways, I mean, I was nervous that I would that I would um, offend somebody. I was nervous that I would miss something. I was nervous. I, absolutely, I was. But I, I also was aware, and I and this is why I say it up front. I was aware of kind of what uh, someone like me, uh, a person who's educated, went to college, lives in the city, um, you know, reads the New York Times what someone like me is supposed to think about this subject. And, uh, and I didn't want to have to think it just because I was supposed to think it. Um, 
And so then I thought, well, okay, well, you know, wh- where does that where does that leave me? What what am I actually looking at? And I will say that in having spent time um, reading about Japan and writing about Japan, I speak Japanese. I, I've come to understand that there there can be a story that's out there circulating in the news, a way in which something is perceived or seen or talked about, and that doesn't mean that that's the lived experience of the people who are in the place. And so I thought, well, that probably also applies to to Christian America. And you know, Christian America that's is a is a huge term. It's a term among the same friends I have who eat organic food and go to Whole Foods might use the term Christian America, um, but. It, but the lived experience of being a Christian in America, of course, is very, very broad. And But if you aren't a Christian, um, you might not know that. Yeah, I thought it was interesting uh, in reading the book that you found lots of shading in the evangelical community that you delved into out there. You went to, I don't know, four or five, six different churches through this whole trip on Sundays every week and had various reactions to them. I found the, the main, I want to say characters, but they're not really characters because they're real people, <laughs> subjects, I guess. We, we, we call them characters. That's okay. Okay. The main characters <laughs> of the book. I mean, I guess journalists call people like this subjects, but that just feels so impersonal to it me. Does. So. It does. And, and we get to know them very well. They had very nuanced views about a lot of things that I think people would just assume that they wouldn't. I, I remember the one conversation in the book with the young man, uh, Justin, who's sort of the very central character in the book, talking about, well, why, why do we go to church? It doesn't say in the Bible anywhere we should go to church. Were you surprised by just how nuanced some of their views were, or maybe even progressive in some senses? Um, I think I was less surprised and more interested. Um, and the degree to, if I was surprised at all, I might have a voice in my head saying to me, oh, people are going to find this interesting or, or, or this is, this is, this is good. This is complex. So I kind of dispensed with my personal feelings of surprise, I knew that the lived experience must be different than the, the experience that I would assume they have if I just read a bunch of headlines. So following that rule, I then really just tried to focus on, well, what, what is happening? What am I looking at? And every time I hear something relevant, I need to write it down. Um, it's possible that those conversations are happening all around us all the time, and we just don't know because... Uh, paying attention to that level of what you call nuance is overridden by what, you know, the, the main story that we have lodged in our heads. I really did walk away feeling like um, it is very human to to be very sure of what one sees and then to just keep trying to, especially as we get older, keep trying to have the same experience and, and, and that we don't expect life to change. Why do you think the divide falls on the line between urban and uh, rural? It's such a great question. There are a number of ways in which that gets explored and illustrated in American Harvest, just in terms of how the land is used and therefore the jobs that go on in the two different places and the people who do those jobs, you have automatically a huge divide. And that's a divide that exists not just in the U.S., but all around the world. Um, You can examine it. There was an article I read about Thailand and this urban-rural divide. Um, I read an article in The Economist It was all about Ethiopia, I think it was, and how young people want to become designers and live in the city, but there's a need for somebody to become a farmer. I mean, this is just a constant tension. Um, And the other thing I'll say is the divide also points to this interdependent relationship that we have, which is that, again, people in cities, which is, I know, shorthand, but... um, for the sake of conversation, I'll just make it short like that, rely on people out of the cities to produce the food and deliver it and process it and bring it into the city. And so the ways in which we live are different. Um, And the the book also sort of touches on the different kinds of knowledge and the different kinds of education that people receive as a result. And then the kind of person you become, the way that you communicate is completely different, again, depending on where one lives. Is some of it occupational? I'm wondering if people who live in rural areas who are not farmers seem to feel the same way about things as farmers do, or if there's something about, you know, working the land and all of that sort of thing. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I think so. And I mean, there's even more. Sure. Yes. And, you know, I've thought a lot about my father, who by the time I knew him wasn't spending the majority of his time on the farm. But there were things like um, the other day during the pandemic, the plumbing broke. 
And if my, I'm in my childhood home, if my father had been alive, my father would have been out there trying to fix it. And he would have already known the way the sewer system worked. And he would have told it to us as a story. Well, you know, this thing was blocked. And when I built it, blah, 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 blah. Um, but I just called a plumber, you know. Um, in my head, knowledge is specialized. And in his head, knowledge was not supposed to be specialized. Well, and along those lines, any number of tools broke during the journey from yes. south to north. And uh, in one instance, uh, it became an occasion to introduce this concept, uh, as I recall, it was called biblical living. Uh, talk about that for just a moment. I thought that was interesting. Yeah, I, I still don't have a... A complete grasp on biblical living, and I'm sure that biblical living means different things to different people. It Biblical living may mean, I think, for some people, because we do meet very kind of as peripheral characters. There's a point in the book, right, where we meet someone who's escaped a very um, strict Amish community, and he becomes a, a truck driver, and he tells us his story. Um, so for his community, biblical living probably means something that um, we would, I'm assuming here, would find really repressive and restrictive and abusive. Um, when Eric used the term for me, he used it right after a combine had broken. We were in the middle of, I think it's Idaho, and unable to find the part to fix the combine. And he remembered somebody who he knew who came and fixed it for free and all the guy wanted was it, it required welding and this young man was an expert welder and all this guy wanted was a chance to drive the combine himself with his son who was six and this gentleman um, with the child had been on Eric's crew many years before and that's the moment where Eric pointed to it and said and that's what we call biblical living. And it was, it was amazing. And it was one of those moments that, again, if I weren't paying attention and hadn't written down, it wouldn't have been in the book. And I remember when I, in early drafts, when I showed this to my editor, my editor said, well, but is that biblical living? Because, you know, you, you prayed for God to help you find a part and God didn't help. And I said, that's, that's, that has nothing to do with what's going on in this scene. Um, Eric is really specifically talking about having spent time with a young man um, when the, when the, when the guy was in his formative years and it turns out that the, the mother of the six year old boy who rides in the combine had been a grain elevator operator, uh, and they had met while this guy was on the road driving Eric's combine. Eric's point was investing in human relationships in a very real way and not expecting to immediately be paid, you know, just investing in somebody because that's the way that you should down the road may yield something beneficial. Um, and he was really trying to, although I just use the language of transaction, he was really, he was really trying to point to just this basic idea of treating your neighbor as, as yourself, right? Treating people the way that you would want to be treated. I suppose in the secular world, it's even been called pay it forward sometimes. Yes, it's a similar concept. And that's what he was talking about. And he called it biblical living. And I had never, <laughs> never heard the term. Um, if you had said that to me prior to this trip, I would have, I would have assumed the worst, you know, um, and we certainly, again, we meet people on the on the trip who have a very restrictive sense of of what that might mean. But that's not how he meant it. Yeah, he went to all these different churches, and at least on a couple of occasions, some of them really made you mad, made you angry. Yes, uh, absolutely. And then others, and this one particularly surprised me, uh, and maybe I'm overstating it, uh, but it was a mega church, I think, in Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. um, that really moved you emotionally, mm -hmm. even though mm -hmm. it was one of these gigantic, you know, TV screen, mm -hmm. big orchestra, mm -hmm. band, production It was you know, a great theatrical things. production. Yeah. yeah. Explain that dichotomy for me a little bit. Well, you bit. know, and the funny thing about that is I was so m moved by the whole thing. And we walk out and the first thing Justin, the young, the young guy in the book who's a Christian, says to me is, this is not going to work on millennials forever. I mean, he is so over the whole thing. We've been talking about Justin, who is the son of Eric, an older man who has worked for your family for a number of years and was sort of your 
your go-between in getting all of this going. Although he's older and, and pretty religious, he also seemed to have some fairly progressive views. I'm wondering if maybe we're all guilty of just painting evangelicals with too broad a brush. I mean, he was okay with gay marriage, for instance. Yeah, I well, I mean, amazing. I think that this is true. And and this is sort of what I was trying to suggest. I just, I, I it's hard for me to give percentages. Um, I... Through, and throughout the book, we meet people like Eric. This is the thing. He wasn't, he wasn't, I don't want to say he's not unusual because I'm, I'm very, I'm very fond of him. And I, I, I think he is unusual, but we meet other Christians who are the same. But I also think that for someone like Eric and, and even his son, Justin, um, they take their faith seriously, seriously in the sense that they take it sincerely, not seriously as in they want to hit anybody over the head with it. It gives meaning to their life. It, it does give them stability and emotional stability through a difficult time. And they don't want to lose that connection. There's only so much about this world that I could understand if I didn't talk about religion, because it's a cornerstone of their values and uh, what motivates them. My curiosity was piqued in this, maybe going down a blind alley. But uh, at one point when you were in Oklahoma, you went with some of the crew members to the National Oklahoma City Memorial. Given the circumstances surrounding that, and I don't want to put too fine a point on it because these folks were extremists, they were domestic terrorists, but they were also kind of in this camp of, you know, don't trust the government, uh, Second Amendment rights because of Waco and so forth. Was there any conversation that happened while you were at the memorial that was kind of interesting on, along those lines? Um, not so much at the memorial, but on the subject of extremism, you have conversations later on in the book that I think are somewhat alarming and disturbing, right? Um, there are a couple of times where the, where the young guys say, you know, is, 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 God go, go, is God going to do something to force people to realize that they have to pay attention? Um, you know, disturbing conversations like that that happen. Well, there's a whole subset of stories in the book uh, related to the book of Revelation, which kind of ties mm -hmm. into that as well. Yes, it does. I mean, I, I introduced Revelation early uh, I <laughs> because I realized what power that text holds. And so I thought, well, this is going to take a lot of examination and understanding. And book of Revelation really doesn't have a lot of meaning for Eric or Justin, right? And they are, as you say, the sort of the the really the open-minded, open-hearted people, um, or well, I, sh I make it sound like nobody else's, and that's not really fair. But they're they're the ones who are most vocal, I think, about explaining how open-hearted they are, and they they model that. Um, but you can see, I get, the text gets discussed all the way throughout my book, and it was discussed throughout the journey, and and influences the culture in these different ways. And I thought, well, I can't have any sort of honest examination of, of Christianity in evangelical America without bringing revelation in. Can you make heads or tails out of this whole thing between evangelicals and not wanting to take the vaccine for COVID? Some of it is this um, distrust of government, not being wanted to be told what to do. There are some people who also, you know, we're putting, and we, we do meet some people in the book, right, who refuse medical treatment. <laughs> there are degrees to which people accept medical treatment or don't accept medical treatment. There's, I visit the grave of somebody who goes to what we call the snake church, um, who died because he wouldn't get medical treatment. And then you have the other Christians in the book who sort of make fun of him for having made that choice. Um, so there's a, you know, there's a whole, a, a spectrum of reasons why. Um, but even during the pandemic, I was really distressed because I would sometimes get texts uh, from people who uh, who I know as a result of writing this book who wanted to insist that the, the pandemic wasn't a real thing. You know, so, yeah, that all of that ties together. And that, again, falls on the on this notion of the divide and what people believe and why, depending on where they are and who they're surrounded by. Did you have the sense that everybody was being truthful with you or that some of them were just telling you what they thought you wanted to hear? I don't actually think there was a lot of lying, but there was certainly silence and there were characters who wouldn't talk to me and the crew becomes increasingly quiet. And that's the way that they would deal with the discomfort rather than with the lying. And there was a great deal of fear that I was going to misrepresent them or misrepresent the world or misrepresent something. That, that was... Um, 
that was a concern. And I would say, you know, I, I didn't I didn't have an interest in misrepresenting anything. Have you heard from a lot of them? Did they feel they were represented accurately? And also, I'm wondering if uh, the folks who are featured in the book uh, have gotten any pushback from their friends who weren't necessarily involved in the process of the book, but who have read what they said to you and then given them so a hard I, time about so it. So I don't know the character of Michael and Justin and Eric and Emily read the book. Um, of course, Michael, Justin and Emily went to college. <laughs> So they read books. Um, Michael's name was changed. He was very unhappy about that. And I said, well, you know, Eric asked me to change everybody's names. Um, Michael also liked the book. Um, but he has continued, you know, we've continued to communicate. Uh, and he comes from a very different America than I do. So, you know, he's somebody who he's somebody who thought the government and the world were overreacting when we were supposed to shut down because of the virus. Um, you know, he's a young and healthy person in a fairly rural community, so he wasn't seeing <laughs> what was happening in cities. So here's a process question for you as a writer. You mentioned that other than, I guess, Eric and Justin are their real names. Everybody else has pretty much got a pseudonym. How did you keep track of that while you're writing it? Did you have a little chart or a key or something above your, your keyboard that said, <laughs> so every, now Michael is was, actually no. Joe? And <laughs> everyone had a real name. And the original drafts were all with real names. And then Eric and Emily and Justin read the manuscript. And Eric called me and asked that I change the names. And so then I got on the phone with Justin and we had fun coming up with other names for everybody. So you just had to do control F and every Joe became Sam or something. Yeah. And I think I think in, there, I think there was an issue with. I think there's a, there are there were a couple of funny typos as a result. I can't remember what they were. Um, readers have probably found them in the book, but yeah. <laughs> Clean those up for the second printing. Yeah, that, that, I, I mean, I was really sure that I wanted Bethany's name to be Bethany because I, um, I think I looked up who Bethany was and because I wondered why there were so many churches called Bethany, and then I thought, well, that'll be a good name, and then and then it just went on from there. What are the questions you hope this book raises in the minds of readers? Um, that's a really great question. Where does my food come from? <laughs> Who is making my food? How do I get my food? Why do I believe what I believe? Is there any room in what I believe for me to question what I believe? And would that be helpful? Um, is there anyone I know who is very different than I am with whom I might try to have um, a, a conversation um, that doesn't, and is in being open to somebody else who's different than I am, can I have a conversation without it shaking the foundation of who I am and making me angry? That is something I think that Eric and Justin, um, but Eric in particular, model well. The ending scene in the book, no spoiler here, we'll just say it has some imagery involved that leads one to believe you're hopeful. Are you hopeful that this can be resolved? Some days I am, and some days really honestly no. <laughs> uh, a friend of mine read this book, who's a writer, and she the question she walked away was um, from the book with was, um, what, what is a human? Which, and there is a point where I asked this question, and I had forgotten about it. But she said, I really think that that's what the book is about. I think you ask, what is a human? Um, and I think that that's kind of a good question. And on days when I believe in the essential goodness of people, um, I feel hopeful. And then there are some days where I think, man, I don't, I don't know. This biological system that we have is not <laughs> engineered to work. And over the course of the pandemic, I've spent a lot of time, I mean, I'm isolated like everybody else. I've spent a lot of time watching things outside the window. So that would be the garden, flowers, and I've done a lot of bird watching. And I've watched, I've had a family of hawks. This is the second year the same hawks have come to nest in my backyard. And they are, you know, an incredibly efficient predator. And sometimes they come to the garden and they want to take a bath in the pond and I still hear all the little birds saying, oh, the hawk is here, the hawk is here, you know. But the hawk just wants to take a bath. 
But then when she, especially the, the female, comes back and is in hunting mode, it's just she's just a precision killing machine. And um, I started taking photos of birds. And I now have a really pretty good camera. And it's an amazing camera. And the camera has a lot of the elements of, of a high-precision weapon. I can track the eyes on birds. If they fly, I can continue to track the bird so that I can take pictures of them in flight. And the other day I thought, man, I'm just, no matter what I do, I'm kind of a predator. You know, my, I, can, I can say I'm just taking birds, I'm not going to kill anything. But it's still all of the thinking that a raptor would use to attack a, a small bird, to kill it, to, to feed its, got, its young. I'm using a lot of the same way of thinking just because I want to have a collection of photos. And so are we able to override that? I mean, uh, there are days when I think, yes, absolutely. You know, there are examples in history where people do. This is why there's the persistence of religion um, to address the human heart so that our impulses are better. But the question of, of loving people who are very different and far away and about whom we have pre prescripted, you know, stories as to who they are and what they are, and therefore we can dismiss them, is really strong. And so I don't know. Someone saw me reading the book the other day and said, oh, what are you reading? And I said, American Harvest. And they said, oh, is it about farming? And I said, well, you know, really, it's kind of about everything. <laughs> <laughs> and it really is. Well, I mean, I think I think until so you, you brought up the book of Revelation. And that's something that I brought up with the crew. The book of Revelation ends in a city. It doesn't actually say that the world is destroyed and everything is obl obliterated. Right? The righteous are supposed to go live in the city. And this is the point where even very literal Christians say, oh, no, well, that's just a metaphor. And then I say, well, if everything you tell me in the book is supposed to be literal, why is suddenly the very end where we go live in a city? Only that is a metaphor. And nobody has an answer for that question. But a detail that I think is sort of interesting is that in this city that everybody is going to go live in is the Tree of Life. So there are no more farms. And in previous iterations of, of the city of God, a certain amount of land is set aside for farmland, right? But in this new vision of the future that we're supposedly given by John of Patmos, everything is in the city, including the food. I guess we'll find out someday or we won't. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but but that seems to speak to this tension, and how, it, can we can we work through that? I don't know. Well, the book is American Harvest: God, Country, and Farming in the Heartland. It's a, a very thoughtful book and really a very lovely read. It's beautifully written, and Thank it you. is available again for folks here in St. Louis at Left Bank Books in the Central West End. Marie Maka, thanks so much for the time today. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much, for, Paul, for the for the conversation and the really intelligent thoughtful questions. I, I so enjoyed this. Justin is stoic while I am crying. Both Justin and Michael have become accustomed to my teariness, which is humbling for me since I'm supposed to be the adult when we are together. But at times like this, I feel as if I've gone back in time and my years of adult learning no longer count. I feel myself to be all ages at once. I'm eight on the farm. I'm 46 in the city, and I'm maybe 20 here talking about God and the structure of the modern evangelical church. How did you know? Why did you decide to talk to me? I ask him. In the beginning, he says, I just wanted you to see that not all Christians are like that. Like what? You know, all the historical baggage. And then, I just wanted you to like us. And then I realized, we're the same. <laughs>